My guest on today's episode of the Keep Going podcast is Dr. Mark Hyman. Dr. Hyman is a practicing family physician and pioneer in the field of functional medicine. Incredibly, he's also a 13 times New York Times bestselling author. He believes in using food as medicine to support longevity, energy, mental clarity, happiness, and so much more. Dr. Hyman is revolutionizing the way that millions worldwide eat and fuel their bodies. And I was thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with him just a couple of weeks ago as he was releasing his new book, The Pegan Diet. We covered a number of topics that I know you will enjoy, including how to conduct a biopsy on your fridge in order to begin eating better, how functional medicine can benefit each of us, the idea of treating the grocery store like a pharmacy, that's pharmacy with an F. And as you'll hear, one thing which really changed the paradigm in my mind, his belief that we should treat sugar like a recreational drug. We wrap up the conversation talking a little bit about Mark's experience at TB12, as he's been a client of ours for some time. I think you'll find my conversation with Dr. Hyman to be loaded with valuable insights and importantly, actionable takeaways that you can use immediately to begin improving your eating habits and to better understand the impact that food has on your health. Let's go. Welcome, Mark, to the TP12 Keep Going Podcast. Happy to have you here today. Well, I'm so happy to be with you guys. Appreciate you taking the time. And we got a lot of exciting things to talk about today. I want to get to your new book uh, in a little bit here. But I thought to start, we could launch with a little bit of a discussion around functional medicine. What is it and how did you get started <laughs> down this path? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Well, everybody, goes, what is functional medicine? I joke and I say it's the opposite of dysfunctional medicine, which is most <laughs> of what we have. Yeah. And, and rather than the science of disease, which is what I learned in medical school, functional medicine is the science of creating health, of optimal performance. It's really the original biohacking operating system. And it's, it's really a way of thinking about disease that's quite different based on understanding the body as a whole ecosystem where everything is connected. The body is just not a bunch of organs. So if you have some patient goes into the doctor with migraines and irritable bowel and arthritis and insomnia and prediabetes and eczema, you know, the doctors say, well, you go see this specialist, that specialist, this specialist. They should be their specialist approach, which is drugs for their particular condition to suppress symptoms. No one asks a simple question, which is, is this just random or is everything connected? For example, all those conditions I mentioned are connected by inflammation. So in functional medicine, we really look at how the body functions and how to optimize that function, both what's impairing the function and how to actually restore function. So uh, for each patient, I'm looking at imbalances in their basic biological systems. It's basically networks. And the body is a network of networks. Uh, which is just like any ecosystem. You know, if you think of monocrop rainforest, I mean, monocrop uh, cornfield, that's not very complex. Well, the body is more like a rainforest. It's this complex dynamic e ecosystem where everything's interacting with everything else. And, and the fact that we've developed medicine the way we have is just an artifact of history, right? Where, yeah. oh, so I have a head pain. I go to the head doctor. I have a stomach pain. I go to the stomach doctor. But your headache might be caused by bacteria in your gut. And your, your, your gut problems might be caused by some environmental toxin that you were exposed to. And traditional medicine really has no way of thinking about these problems. So functional medicine at the very core is, is really about getting to the why. It's about understanding root causes. It's about optimizing in health and performance and function in each of these systems. It's about taking out the bad stuff, putting the good stuff, and letting the natural intelligence and healing of the body take over. It's incredible to hear you talk about it because when I hear you speak of <coughs> traditional medicine, I'm sure as most people have trained, it feels very effective focus where you're focused yeah. very much more so on the cause as you said that's like, right very, that's very right on the cause yeah that's now, right i mean you, you can have one disease that has you know many many causes and one cause that can create many diseases so for example let's say rheumatoid arthritis could be caused by uh, troubles with a leaky gut or environmental toxins or lyme disease or um maybe some parasite that you got in india yeah. so basically we don't have a way of navigating to the answers with traditional medicine. On the other hand, something like gluten or mercury can cause a whole myriad of different problems with your biology that show up as dozens and dozens of different diseases. You know, so 
So gluten intolerance or even celiac can show up as osteoporosis or anemia or schizophrenia or autism or inflammatory bowel disease or osteoporosis or you know, like, yeah. so, so we say, well, well, well how, how are we so poorly uh, organized in terms of our thinking? It's just, it's just because, you know, we're just in an evolutionary process. And I think we're in the ma most massive paradigm shift in scientific medicine that we've had in a hundred years since the discovery of the germ and the antibiotic. I mean, we are, it's that big of a paradigm shift. And yet most uh, doctors, most patients, and certainly healthcare systems have not clued into this yet. I mean, Cleveland Clinic is the first where we've now developed the first center for functional medicine at any major medical hospital. Mayo Clinic now has a center for functional integrated medicine because they saw we did it. Yeah. Um, so those are, you know, we got Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic who are the leading hospitals in the world, like number one and two. When they're starting to dip their toe in, you know, this is where we're headed. Yeah, it's incredible. And when you look at the system, I know one of the things you talk about in your most recent book, which we'll get to in a little bit, is these, the, the seven systems. Could you just touch briefly on how these systems are interconnected a little more specifically? Sure. So, you know, just sort of linking back to what I said before, you know, when, when you go to the medical diagnosis code book now, there's 155,000 diseases. Okay. And they're all, and it's all based on symptoms. Okay. I have rheumatoid arthritis. It's in left, my left pinky, but it's only every other Thursday, but only when the Pope's in town. I mean, it's that level of granularity, right? And it's very, it's what I call phenomenological. It's descriptive. We describe the symptoms, but we don't talk about why. Functional medicine uh, is really focused on the why. And rather than there's 155,000 diseases, there are only, only seven core systems that are influenced by your genetics and environmental factors, toxins, allergens, and microbes, and so forth, and by your lifestyle factors, your diet, exercise, sleep, stress, relationships, etc. All those influence these seven core functional systems. When out of when those systems are out of balance, disease occurs. When those systems are in balance, we're healthy. So those seven systems are what I focus on every day with patients. That's all I do. I don't really treat diseases. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so the first one is your and one of the most important is your gut. I mean your whole assimilation, digestive system, the microbiome, all of that plays an enormous role in our health. And it's really driving so much inflammation because of our poor diet, we've really damaged it. And we don't eat foods that are high in fiber and phytonutrients and probiotics and prebiotics. So we just end up with this mis massive gut problems in this country that are driving all these other problems. Then there's your immune system. And then, by the way, these are not separate. So 70% of your, 60 to 70% of your immune system lives in your gut, right? So everything relates to everything else. It's like a, it's like a giant interconnected web, uh, like a neural network almost. Uh, but it, but there but you know for for description purposes we separate them out. But there's your, so your gut, your immune system. Then there's your energy system. How do you make energy? Uh, you know this is really important if you want to build muscle, if you want to increase you know fitness through interval training. But there's also uh, specific nutrients that the, the, the body needs to make energy from food and oxygen. So we eat and we breathe. We make energy. Well, there's a whole series of things that are required to do that, and a lot of things can interrupt that, and that leads to fatigue and all kinds of health issues. Neuro, neurocognitive issues, metabolic issues, diabetes. I mean, if your mitochondria aren't working, that's pretty much the beginning of the end for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a then, real problem. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the a lot of the work around longevity research is focused on, on mitochondria, whether it's ketogenic diets, time restricted eating, uh, intermittent fasting. You know, people using NAD, other products. These are these are all ways of optimizing the mitochondria. And then there's the detoxification system, which is how our bodies handle waste. And, and and do we we excrete it well through our liver, kidneys, your, and 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 stool? That's important. And sweat; those are really important. But we also are, are overloaded with so many toxins from the environment. So how do we upregulate our detox system? How do we identify toxins? And for me, you ask me how did I get into this? Well, I got mercury poisoning from living in China, and that's what led me to discover functional medicine because mercury is the most potent toxin on the planet, other than plutonium, and it, it interrupts almost every one of the body's functions. So my immune system was screwed up. My my gut was screwed up, my mitochondria were screwed up, my detox was screwed up, my hormones were screwed up, and so forth. So everything was kind of messed up. So that's how I learned about uh, mostly for functional medicine was through the inside out, fixing myself from mercury poisoning. I'm a big tuna and, guy. You're getting me scared right now. Oh, you do not <laughs> want to be eating tuna on a regular basis. I really don't want to do that. I I, I love tuna. Trust okay. me. I, I give it up. I give it up. Uh, I mean, I see so many people with, with latent mercury problems. And it might not be show up for many, many years, but it might show up as heart disease or it might show up as Dementia might show up as cancer, might show up as, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, insomnia. So we don't really don't know how it's going to affect individuals, but, but it's important to think about. And then, uh, so functional medicine is really about looking at that. And then we look at transport, 
which is essentially your circulatory system and lymphatic system to move things around, and your communication systems, your hormones, neurotransmitters, inflammatory markers. So we, we really want to have optimal communications. Um, and lastly is your structural system, which is what you're made of, everything from your biomechanical structure, which you work on a lot at TB12, to right down to the subcellular structures of what your membranes are made of and your mitochondria are made of and all your tissues are made of. Because you are what you eat, essentially. So if you want, you want to be made up of a Twinkie, that's one, that's one kind of body. If you're made up of you know healthy whole foods, that's another type of body that you're going to make. And the truth is, you, you know, you, you constantly renewing and rebuilding. And the only raw materials you get to that is what you put in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, food is the most powerful modulator of all these seven systems. So in my book, The Peak and Diet, I talk about, one, how food is medicine, but two, how it regulates all these different systems for good or bad. You know, if you eat the wrong foods, it's going to screw things up. If you eat the right foods, it's going to help. And I'll just give you an example. If you have trans fat, which is in margarine shortening, which was really ruled as not safe to eat by the FDA, but it's still in foods, by the way, because the FDA weather doesn't really crack down that much and has given companies a long runway to get rid of it. If you eat trans fat, it binds to a receptor on the nucleus of your cells. And it, and it basically affects your mitochondria, the energy production, and slows it down. So it slows your metabolism. It turns on genes that drive inflammation in the body, <laughs> and it makes you more diabetic, pre-diabetic. On the other hand, if you take the same exact amount of fat, but it's from fish oil, right, EPA, which is a different fat, binds to the same receptor, profoundly different effects. It turns on your metabolism, so it speeds it up in your mitochondria. It reduces inflammation, and it reverses prediabetes or insulin resistance. So that's just one example out of like, literally thousands of examples of how food is not just calories. Because you could say, well, this is 100 calories of trans fat, 100 calories of fish oil. It should be the same. Totally different when you eat totally that. Totally different. Yeah. Not not in the laboratory. Oh, hi, hi, Dr. Hyman, you know, first law of thermodynamics, you're, you know, you, who are you to question, you know, that. But I'm not questioning it. What I'm saying is, is this is true in a vacuum. And if you read, if you read the first law of thermodynamics, which I have, it, it talks about energy is conserved in a system, in a closed system, which means a vacuum. So if you drop leathers, leathers, feathers and lead off a bridge. The lead goes boom, and the feathers go like this. Yeah, if they're both. If you drop them in a vacuum where there's no air, they both go boom, same rate. Why? The air is not there, and so our metabolism and our biology is like the air. When you eat a calorie, when you, it doesn't act the same as when you burn it in the lab. If you burn a thousand calories of soda and a thousand calories of broccoli in the lab, it releases the same amount of energy, which is calories defined as the amount of energy required to raise one liter of water, one degree centigrade. That's what a calorie is, right? But but if you take the same thousand calories of soda and then thousand calories of broccoli and you eat them, they're going to have profoundly different effects on your biology in terms of your hormones, insulin, blood sugar, cholesterol, all the phytochemicals that are in the broccoli, all the sugar that's in the soda. So that's an, an example of how we think differently about food as information, not just uh, calories. Yeah, it's interesting I, when you use the example of margarine, it just flashes me back to growing up and my grandfather was <laughs> like, have margarine, have margarine. I, I Fleischmann's, remember, yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing my grandfather have a heart attack and he's being told to eat more margarine, more margarine. Uh, it's like, yeah, what a, it's uh, like no better than smoking what was done to people with that. Worse, like, probably terrible. worse. Yeah, probably, probably worse. worse. It's killed, it's, it's killed literally probably millions of people around the world. Millions of people, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's move now a little forward to, we got a new book mm -hmm. out. The mm. uh, the vegan the vegan diet um, right here holding up I actually yes. just read yep. it this weekend so thank you for that copy it's terrific um, let's talk about the vegan diet where did it come from uh, what's the <laughs> genesis of the vegan diet well you know I, I I've been humbled by being a doctor on the front lines and studying nutrition for forty years and treating tens of thousands of patients and testing them with you know literally millions of lab tests over decades and I've just been humbled by how we're all different and we need to personalize nutrition and by the simple idea that, that, you know, food is medicine and that there are really some common principles that we all agree on in the center that are understood to be true scientifically that promote health. We remove the harmful foods we put in the protective foods. It's, it's really not that complicated, but all the diet wars make people confused. And that's why the book's called the Pegan diet, 21 practical principles for reclaiming your health in a nutritionally confusing world. So one day I was sitting on a panel with a friend of mine who was a vegan cardiologist. The other one was a paleo doctor. And they were like fighting like cats and dogs. And I'm right there. I'm like middle. literally in the middle. Like literally. I have a picture of it too. And, 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 
And I said, God, if, and, and the mood was getting really tense. And I'm like, listen, if you're paleo and you're vegan, I must be pegan. And everybody laughed in the audience. And I was like, oh, that was a good joke. Lighten the mood. You know, just kind of take the tension out of the air. <laughs> and then I thought about it and I went home and I was like, wait a minute. They're the same. They're exactly the same, except for one thing, which is where to get the protein, animals or grains and beans. Otherwise, they both agree we should be eating whole foods. Both agree we should cut out starch and sugar. Both agree we should be eating more whole, healthy food fats. Both agree we should cut out refined and processed oils. Both agree we should be uh, eating you know, more nuts and seeds. Both agree we should be getting rid of dairy even. And, and, and both agree we should be eating foods that are full of things that aren't food, like food additives, which we eat five pounds a year, pesticides, hormones, antibiotics, uh, and maybe even GMO food. So there's a general consensus about what healthy eating is. It's just around the edges that they're different. So I said, look, we, we need to come up with a set of principles that's inclusive, that uh, is not dogmatic, that's personalized, that the fundamental driving intel inside of it is that food is medicine, that quality matters. Whatever you're eating, quality matters. If you're a vegan and you're a chips and soda vegan, you're in trouble. If you're paleo and you're Eating, you know, bacon and, and, and cream all day, you're in trouble. So I think yeah, like the number of times I've seen vegetarians loaded up on pastas and breads and everything. Else. <clears throat> yeah. Oh my God. It's terrible. I see so many. I saw a guy the other day who was, you know, really trying to be healthy, he was, you know, mid fifties. He looked like he was in mid seventies. He had a giant pot belly. He's like, I've been a vegetarian for years. Like, but you know, he's just so carbohydrate intolerant. For him, that's the worst possible diet. For him, it's an ideology. And I always say, you don't want to let your ideology trample over your biology. Right, <laughs> you would think you yeah. philosophically you want to be a, a vegan, but what if your body just doesn't agree? <laughs> Listen yeah. to your body. So one of the things you talk about in your book, you know, these different diets all have different recommendations. One of the things that I thought you said in the book, which was very interesting to me, was um, the notion of plant rich versus plant based. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because there's yeah, so yeah. much about plant based, and again, we talk a lot about being plant based here at TV12 as well. And I say, gosh, yeah. I like to know something here with this plant rich thing. Well, I think, I think you know, plant based in my mind means 100% vegan, zero animal products. And the truth is that, you know, most of the world's population is not going to do that. Um, philosophically, culturally, um, even medically. But we should all be eating what, what I call a plant rich diet. Uh, some people call it a plant forward diet. But the idea is that most of your diet, at least 80 to 90% should be plants whole foods, lots of veggies and fruits, non-starchy veggies should be the bulk of your diet. So really, really important. So last night for dinner, we had, you know, sweet potatoes, which were roasted, which is fine, starchy vegetable. We had beets, we had uh, string beans, we had uh, a big salad with, you know, lots of vegetables and tomatoes. So we had like four, four vegetable dishes and we had a small piece of grilled fish, like a palm sized piece of fish, right? So fish, the, the protein is like a side dish where the, 80% of my plate or 90% of my plate was just veggies. And they were, you know, whole food veggies. And and I, I use sweet potatoes. Those are fine in moderation. Um, and, and it's really a way of eating that increases the phytochemical content of your diet. Now, phytochemicals are these powerful plant compounds. There's 25,000 of them in food that regulate every one of these seven systems. And so I'll give you a quick example of why they're so important. So if you eat, um, for example, um, broccoli or collards or kale or brussels sprouts or any of that family it has these special chemicals called sulforaphanes or glucosinolates which upregulate your body's detoxification systems by increasing something called glutathione it's the body's main detoxifier and it's been shown to reduce the risk of cancer and many other things i actually remember a study in china where they literally looked at the levels of the metabolites of these cruciferous vegetables in urine and the patients with the highest levels of these can uh, uh, metabolites from broccoli had the lowest levels of cancer that's one example. Or another would be, let's say your, you know, your gut isn't super healthy and your microbiome is out of balance and you have low levels of particular bacteria called acromancia, mucinophilia, which provides a lining in your gut that protects it from becoming leaky or damaged and letting the food and the poop basically leak in your immune system. Uh, that bacteria loves pomegranate, green tea, and cranberries. <laughs> so, you know, you can literally feed different systems in your body in ways that actually help regulate it. For example, lignans in flax seeds help regulate the hormone metabolism in your gut. Uh, and so for estrogen and other, other, other hormones. So I think it's really important to understand that everything you eat has the potential to upgrade or downgrade your biological software to harm or to heal. 
And, and it's really important to think about food, not just as energy to get through the day or you know, power up, but what is the quality of the food you're eating? And so when I say plant rich, it's really about upgrading the quality and not all plants are the same. You know, if you eat a industrial grown tomato, it's designed to be, you know, not smushed in a box and shipped for a thousand miles, very different than if you go to uh, your garden on a hot late August summer day and have a vine ripe and cherry tomato that explodes in your mouth with flavor. That flavor, that flavor is the phytochemicals. That's what that is. So when you're eating a tomato that tastes like cardboard, you're not getting any real tomato in this. In this. <laughs> you're not getting the antioxidants and the anti-inflammatory compounds and the lycopene that prevents cancer and all these wonderful things because of, of how the food was grown or the way it was bred. See, most, most of the food we're eating now was bred to increase yields, to increase starch content, not for nutrient density, not for vitamins and minerals, and not for phytochemicals. So if you eat a wild, if you eat a wild dandelion, like that's, we think spinach is so healthy, but it's a thousand times more nutrient dense than, than spinach. Or if you have wild blueberries, far more nutrient dense than, you know, regular blueberries. Or if you have, you know, an heirloom, uh, you know, like potato from Peru, those little tiny purple potatoes versus a giant Yukon starchy potato from Idaho, it's totally different food in terms of its uh, effect on your blood sugar, it's the phytonutrients involved and, and all that. So I think it's really important to think about how do we, how do we, how do we really get that uh, dialed in? So we're eating more and more of the, the things that we should be eating that help upregulate our health. Yeah. I think it's incredible to hear you speak about the amount of control that we can take over our health by what we eat, right? Cause you can make oh, it every day. It's fascinating. To me. Yeah. I mean, literally, uh, John, when I go to the when I go to the grocery store, I, I think of it as my drugstore, my pharmacy. That's F A R M A C Y. I literally go in there and go down the produce aisle. I stay around most of the edges. I mean, I'll go down the some of the aisles to get olive oil, whatever. But but you know, I go through and I go, oh, gee, there's artichoke. That's got prebiotics and that has components that help upregulate my detoxification system. Oh, there's a pomegranate that's going to feed the acromancy, and that's also going to increase something called urolithin A in my metabolism. And that's going to increase my muscle mass and, and clean up my old mitochondria. Or I'm going to I'm going to go eat um, this this asparagus because I know it's very high in certain B vitamins are important folate, but it also has a prebiotic fibers in it. It's going to help feed the good bugs in my gut. Or no, I'm going to go and have some cilantro because it's very detoxifying and, and getting rid of heavy metals. Or I'm going to have rosemary because it's super anti-inflammatory. Or I'm gonna, so I, I go through. Or I'm going to eat ginger because I got to buy the ginger because the flow gingerols that again are anti-inflammatory into microbial. So I basically think about like, how do I, how do I concoct my dinner? So I'm literally eating, uh, eating at, at my pharmacy <laughs> and, and eating the drug, the drugs that actually help regulate and heal and improve all these seven systems that it's create the, health. Yeah. I mean, the information is there too. And you could, you could read a great book like the vegan diet, but yet people still make bad choices. And I think some of it is cultural and society with food. Like the example I usually just talking about is meat. It's interesting the way you said it. You know, you go to a restaurant, the meat is the focus of the, of the meal. It's not everything else. And you, know, you talk about just the palm size piece of fish. Like, I think in the book, you even, what you called it? Uh, not condom Con meat. Condom meat. Condom meat. Yeah, meat. That's what it was. Yeah. It's, like, it's, I mean, it's a cultural thing at some level, right? In society is like changing the way people think about it. Absolutely. It's absolutely true. And I think, I, I think, you know, we, we, we've unfortunately had an agricultural system that has been designed to, promote the consumption, the production and consumption of foods which are killing us. The three main crops are wheat, corn, and soy, which are turned into every manner of processed food and then also fed to animals for, you know, processing the animals. And the, and the truth is that, um, you know, there were the four food groups that we used to know, meat, milk, you know, veggies, whatever, grains, that, that was just an invention that had anything to do with science of the USDA with the farming industry to promote the sale of their products. It had nothing to do with health. <laughs> and then the food pyramid came along and we, you know, we tried to tell people to eat low fat and eat lots of carbs and bread, rice, cereal, and pasta every day. And we listened and then our weight and metabolism got worse. And we're now seeing the worst pandemic of obesity and diabetes we've ever seen in history. Uh, and it's, and now with COVID, we're seeing the double pandemic of being over fat and metabolically unhealthy 
which is on top, which is is why so many people with COVID get really sick is because of this poor metabolic health. So you got the pandemic of COVID on top of the pandemic of being over fat, and that's really driving the the deaths in this country, driving the hospitalizations and the challenges we're facing. Yeah, and I want to touch on this notion of insulin resistance, and I think the segue to that, I want to share with you my favorite part of the book. Uh, I think it's okay. The genius, the way you describe this. You said treat sugar like a recreational drug. Yeah. <laughs> like that doesn't stand out when you read this book. I mean, that was, I thought that was incredible, Mark. Like, so let's talk a little bit about that. I, I've never, uh, you obviously, you know, in the business of health and wellness, I've been around this stuff for a long time. I have never heard someone say it like just like that. Like, you threw it on the table right there. And, and it's great. Yeah. We'll talk about well, it's well. Look, as, as hunter gatherers, if we were lucky, we'd find a, a honeycomb or we'd get some berries, and we'd basically eat, eat the equivalent of twenty-two teaspoons of sugar a year. And now we consume that a day per person, and some a lot more. So kids up to thirty-four teaspoons a day, about one hundred and fifty-two pounds per person per year. That's almost half a pound a day of sugar, and it's in everything. It's in our breakfast cereal, it's 75% sugar. I mean, if you have sugar for breakfast in this country, it's the worst thing we could possibly do for our health. You know. Muffins, bagels, right? Croissants, lattes with sugar in them, and pancakes, you know, French toast. I mean, this is breakfast cereal. Cereal is, I mean, what an invention. Yeah, cereal's the, bad. Cereal's I bad. mean, most cereals are 75% sugar. So that's terrible. And then, of course, you know, it's in everything. It's in salad dressing. It's in tomato sauce. I mean, your, your, your serving of tomato sauce for your pasta has more sugar per serving than two Oreo cookies. <laughs> Oh. So it's everywhere and it's hidden. Uh, and it's really hidden in processed foods is how they make things taste good. I'm like, why are you putting sugar in salad dressing? I don't understand. Like, <laughs> and, yet, and yet it's in everything and it's highly addictive uh, and, it, and, it's, and it is a drug. And it does activate the same receptors in your brain as cocaine or heroin or morphine. Uh, we know that scientifically if you basically blind people and you feed them a, 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 what tastes like an exactly the same milkshake, one is a low sugar milkshake and one is a high sugar milkshake. Um, the high sugar milkshake will literally, and these are the same in terms of protein, fat, calories, carbs, everything's the same. It's just where the carbs come from that make it higher or low sugar. When they look at the brain of these people, not only are they hungry and their blood sugar and insulin, everything is whacked out, but these people have the area of their brain lit up called the nucleus accumbens, which is ground zero for addiction. It's what gets lit up with heroin or cocaine or anything else. So, so literally, sugar lights up that same area. And if you look at the animal studies, it's frightening. Literally, rats will continue to eat sugar while they're getting electrically shocked. Wow. <laughs> so they'll like be sitting on an electric shot floor, right? And they just keep shocking them, and they'll keep eating the sugar. If rats are addicted to cocaine, they will swap over to sugar if given the chance. They will work eight times harder to get the sugar than the cocaine. Oh, that's incredible. So, it's really frightening, yeah. And and we know we know this is true, and I see it in clinical practice that people literally literally get addicted to sugar, and they think I can't stop it, I crave it, I need it, I have to have it. And the truth is, you don't. And when you stop, you won't want it, uh, and the body your body will adjust. I, I put people through a, a, a week long rejuvenation detox program, and at the end, there's no sugar at all. The whole thing. At the end, we give them some chia pudding with coconut milk and some berries, and they think it's like sweet, the sweetest candy they've ever eaten. <laughs> Yeah. And it's just berries, right? Because <laughs> they haven't well, even had fruit. Of, a piece of chocolate cake at that point. They're so excited for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's it's like it's like your your body adjusts, and yet if you're yeah. if you're assaulting your taste buds with some sweeteners every day and artificial sweeteners, which are a thousand times more sweet than regular sugar, then you, your body just becomes accommodated to high levels of sugar. So I think you know, think of sugar as a recreational drug. I don't avoid it a hundred percent, but I don't like. I love tequila, but I might have it once a week. <laughs> I don't have it every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and every snack. Yeah. Very, very different uh, take on sugar. I, I love that line. And I think, you know, part of where you go in the book is the notion that um, it's some of the sugar contributes to the insulin resistance and insulin issues and metabolic diseases and disorders, which is a big part of your practice and what you see. And even as we were saying before, you can talk about immune issues as a result of that. And it's very obviously present in people's minds right now uh, with everything going on with COVID. Yeah. So, you know, right now we're, we're in a situation where where we have a very susceptible population to COVID because when you're pre-inflamed because you're over fat, meaning you have belly fat or you are anywhere in the continuum of pre-diabetes and diabetes, which affects uh, scarily 88% of Americans. That's almost nine out of 10 Americans, 88%. Wow. 
wow. are metabolically unhealthy. Now, they, may not, they may not have prediabetes according to the classical definition, but they are in the spectrum. And it's a linear relationship between increasing belly fat and your body mass index and your risk of death from COVID. It's just, it's just there's, no, there's no point at which it's like, oh, you're fine up to this point. Any, any increase from no normal or optimal increases your risk. So I think we have a situation where um, 88% of us are pre-diabetic or some level of, of insulin resistance. And what that does is it accelerates every aspect of aging. It causes inflammation. It causes um, heart attacks, cancer, diabetes. And now they're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, depression, you name it, pretty much everything, loss of muscle. And people think, oh, you know, I can work out and I can exercise and, and it's fine. I can eat whatever I want. And it's just not. I, 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 ha I had a trainer in, in New York um, who was a very fit uh, guy. It was like really, you know, big muscles, weight, you know, crazy amount of stuff he could lift. But he had this huge layer of fat over him. Like he looked kind of ripped, but he, but, but really he, he had all this inflammatory stuff going on. He was eating too many carbs and he, he actually went on the program that I gave him and he lost like the pegan diet. He lost 20 pounds in six weeks and his body totally transformed and he became so much more lean and, and fit because no matter how much he exercised he did, he couldn't exercise his way out of a bad diet. And it wasn't, he was eating, even, even eating terribly. He just was eating more on the high glycemic side of, you know, grains and beans and starches and things like that. So I, I think it's really important for people to understand that, that, you know, the food and the quality of the food you eat determines your metabolic health and particularly the amount of starch and sugar. So cutting that down to almost none or minimum is really important. And then the more fit you get, like if you, if you know, like if I ride my bike 30 miles a day and I work out with you guys at TB12, you know. I can eat more. I have more metabolic resilience and I won't gain weight or it won't adversely affect me. But <clears throat> you know, many of us are not that resilient anymore metabolically. And we have to sort of get there before we can start to be more liberal. Yeah. So it's about how, how, how do you get to a therapeutic approach until you're on a maintenance program? Yeah. I think the good news is, you know, point out in the book, and as you're saying here today, I mean, we have some control over it. The choices we make are too, you know, enable us to have some control, which is important. One of the other things you talked about in the book, which I think is, very important just relative to where we are as a society right now, the culture going on with COVID and everything happening is mood and anxiety. And I think one of the other things that was interesting is you talked a little bit about how food can impact the mood. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I mean, the data on this is just striking. I mean, there, there are, you know, when I wrote my book, Ultra Mind Solution, about 12 years ago, there was nobody talking about the relationship between food and mood or between the microbiome and mood or other things. And um, now there's a department of metabolic psychiatry at Stanford where they're looking at the role of insulin resistance and sugar and stuff on depression. Another department of nutritional psychiatry at Harvard, they're looking at the nutritional status and the microbiome and its effect on mood. So the single biggest thing we do every day to regulate our biology, our hormones, our brain chemistry, our neurotransmitters is what we eat. So when they, when they do randomized controlled trials of, uh, swapping out healthy food for junk food, you know, swapping out the junk food for healthy food, they find dramatic reductions in depression as equivalent to any medication. Uh, what's even more striking to me is, you know, this also affects cognitive function and behavior. So we know in kids, nutritional uh, status affects their ability to learn and focus and pay attention and have uh, good grades. I mean, it's really quite striking. And then even behaviorally, we see that, you know, in, in juvenile detention centers where kids are really violent, aggressive, need to use restraints, there's suicides, that there's a 91% reduction in Violent behavior, use of restraints, 100% reduction in suicides. I mean, you think about that. Mm -hmm. When you think about that, suicide is the third leading cause of death in that age group. And if there's a therapy that reduces suicide by 100% in that age group, you think it would be headline news. Yeah, but you exactly. don't hear about it. You don't hear about it because it's not a pill. It's not a drug. And yet, uh, that's what they found in this study, that, that they were able to actually dramatically reduce this. And so, we, whether it's violent crime in prisons, whether it's juvenile detention, food has an enormous impact. Um, and if we're eating foods that are brain activating, it's, it's very bad. If we're eating foods that are high in sugar and starch and processed ingredients, refined oils, food additives, chemicals. I mean, aspartame has neurotoxic effects, which is in our most artificial sweeteners. So, we really have a deep understanding. And I, I remember one patient, John, who came to see me uh, and part of the Daniel plan, which is a faith-based wellness program that I did. And the, the striking thing was that, you know, she'd been in and out of hospitals, psychiatric hospitals her whole life. She had been 
um, you know, struggling with her marriage. She was about to get fired from her job. She was really, really overweight, really unhealthy, uh, and ate a horrible diet. And, and on the Daniel plan, which is essentially based on the same ideas as this pegan diet, she uh, not only, um, you know, lost 43 pounds in the first six weeks, but she came up to me after. She said, Dr. Hyman, I don't understand. Could it be possible that changing my diet could cure my depression in three days? And I'm like, yeah, if you're eating something that's causing your brain to be inflamed, and you stop eating it and you start eating foods that are anti-inflammatory, yes, because we know that it, depression is an inflammatory disease of the brain. I want to say that again. Depression is an inflammatory disease of the brain. And taking Advil isn't going to help. <laughs> okay? yeah. You've got to get rid of the things that are driving inflammation, which is our American processed diet. We call it the SAD diet, the standard American diet. So that's really key. And, and eating the way that I described the pegan diet, which is flexible, inclusive, can be adaptable to many cultural and individual preferences and be personalized. It's based on the idea that food is medicine. If you eat that way, you literally can transform your biology very quickly, not in months or years, but literally in days and weeks. Yeah. I think one of the, my takeaways from the book and the conversation, you just hit on it, is you've organized this diet to be very sustainable. Right? I think a lot of diets are hard. People go all in in one direction or all in yeah. in the direction. They yeah. never have sustainable success. But I think you've, you've given people a prescription for sustainable success with the vegan diet. I it's not really a diet. That's the joke about it, right? It's a set of guidelines and principles. And if you want to eat anything, it, it describes what to eat. In other words, if you want to eat dairy, well, which dairy? If you want to eat meat, which meat? If you want to eat grains, which grains? If you want to eat veggies, which are the best veggies? So it really takes you down very deep into understanding how to use the different foods we do eat and upgrade the quality of those foods, find the right foods within each of those categories. So it doesn't really, it's not really exclusive of things. So for example, dairy is a great example. If you are eating traditional feedlot dairy, it's from Holstein cows that have been hybridized to produce tons of milk. It has A1 casein. It's super inflammatory. It's pumped from hormones, antibiotics. It's grown on an unnatural diet of corn and silage and all kinds of weird stuff. How is that the same as, for example, a, a, a you know sheep or goat milk, which is where the sheep and goat are grazing on wild grasses or a complex array of plants where their phytochemicals are in the milk, where there are A2 casein, which is less inflammatory, where there's no hormones or antibiotics, and that has very different effects on your body. That's just one example. So I think, I think we have to understand what we're eating and how to pick the best things. And that's really what's so great about the vegan diet is it, for any, anybody, it really is set of Within, within each area of preferences or cultural or dietary or philosophical preferences, what, what should we be eating and how? Yeah. You, can find, you can find your own way and you can start, you know, you can start this afternoon, which is great. So let's talk about that then. So for mm -hmm. our listeners, who many of which are health-oriented and health-conscious, trying to have better outcomes, uh, how do I get started on this journey of the vegan diet? Like where's, what's step one for me? Well, it's pretty easy. I outline it in the book. Uh, but in the first, I, I always joke, the first thing you want to do is do a, a fridge and a cupboard and a pantry biopsy. And you want to go through and you want to, you want to just get uh, all the things out of there that aren't food. <laughs> right? And so you want to get out of there all the, all the things that have any ingredients you can't pronounce, you don't recognize, or that uh, you wouldn't really put on your food in your cupboard. In other words, dude, you have butylated hydroxytoluene in your cupboard that you sprinkle on your salad dressing. No, but it's in every processed food. It's basically BHT. It's banned in Europe. It's a carcinogen and it's a preservative. Uh, <clears throat> um, and then you want to sort of get to the, the place where you're really focusing on a, a simple question. I, 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 I often speak at churches and I sort of joke and I say it's really easy to figure out what to eat. Ask yourself one question when you pick it up. Is, did God make this or nature, if you don't believe in God, make this or did man make it? Did God make a Twinkie? No. Did God make an avocado? Yeah. yeah. Pretty easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and any, even, even a kindergartner can figure that out. Figure that out, you know? yeah. Right? Did God make a donut? No. Did he make an apple? Yeah, right? Um, did he make corn on the cob? Yes. Did he make high fructose corn syrup? No. <laughs> right? Um, and then, you know, get get rid of foods with labels. I mean, you know, most of the stuff we should be eating should be just the food itself. I mean, you don't have a nutrition facts label on an almond or an ingredient list. It's just an almond or an egg, right? Eat real food. And, of course, if it has a label, that's fine. I mean, there, there are products out there that I use that are packaged products. They might have a jar of, you know, cashew butter, or but it just says cashews and salt or whatever. You know, it's like not a lot of things in there. 
Um, also, when you go shopping, make sure you shop around the outside of the store. You've heard this before, but essentially you want to eat all the foods that are actually real things you recognize from the original source. If you can't recognize it from when it came from the farm, probably don't eat it, right? Oh, I can see this is a carrot. I guess it came from the farm or this is an egg. It came from the farm or this is a chicken. It came from, it's like you kind of get it. Um, and then we talked about the, 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 the plant forward or plant rich diet. It should be really 75% of colorful fruits and vegetables. Meat as a side dish, it's not the center, but protein is important, particularly as you age. You want to make sure you eat plenty of fats. Fat is really key and good fats, avocados, nuts and seeds, olive oil, they're my favorites. Superfoods are important. So make sure you eat a whole rainbow of colors. That's one of the second principles is eat the rainbow, but you want to eat all the colorful pigments in nature. That's where all the medicine is. Dairy, okay for some, but I would stick with the sheep and goat, particularly organic. Uh, grains are okay, but mostly gluten-free. A lot of people have gluten issues. Nut seeds, fine. Low starch beans, fine. Uh, and then, you know, enjoy life. Like, it's not about being perfect. It's about understanding how to eat food. So, people say, do you cheat, Dr. Hyman? Yes, I'll have a cookie. <clears throat> but... It'll be usually, <laughs> it might be a grain-free cookie made from like the ones I have in my cookbook, or <clears throat> it might be made from whole real ingredients. So I made pancakes the other day, uh, which is a new recipe in the vegan diet. It's my favorite recipe in the, in the book. Uh, it's chai buckwheat pancakes. Now, these pancakes are not your average pancakes. They're not like from, made from refined white flour that's sprayed with glyphosate, that's super starchy, that has preservatives in it that cause neurologic issues, and that... Uh, has extra gluten in it that causes all sorts of problems with inflammation. It's made from almond flour and buckwheat flour from pasture-raised eggs, and it has all the chai spices in it, which are highly medicinal because that's where all the phytochemicals are and spices. And it has a, I use a special kind of flour called Himalayan tartary buckwheat, which is higher in protein. It's got 132 phytochemicals that upregulate and rejuvenate your immune system. And so I can guilt-free eat these pancakes, which are delicious, uh, simply by making the right choices about the quality of the ingredients. So it's not about deprivation. It's really about understanding what's really uh, a whole food or real food and sticking to that and understanding that every bit of food you put in your mouth is information. And, and I always want to put the right information in. So you'll never see me eat Skittles or anything like that, but, but I, will, I will eat whole food, real stuff that might be considered a treat. Yeah, you used an expression there, which I want to grab hold on. The food you put in your mouth. So I think one of the key takeaways I want people to have from this conversation is that <clears throat> you can control the outcomes here. You know, food is medicine, as you're saying. You have these choices. You've given a, a structure for people to be flexible and have it work with their, you know, lifestyle. Like, you have control. It's not just uh, up to some external force. And I think that's a big takeaway for me from the conversation. Absolutely. The message people need to hear these days too, right? Because they, they feel so much that they're under siege from all these external forces from a health standpoint, but you're giving people a path. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to just transition for a second before we wrap up. You know, I had to meet you, I had the opportunity to meet you as a patient 10 years ago, but more recently you've uh, been coming to visit us at TB12. So I was hoping yeah. that you could just briefly touch on your experience with TB12. Here you are, you know, at the center of all things health and wellness. And you know, we we're fortunate you found found our way to us, and I think we'll be able to help you out a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've known Tom for a while. I had the pleasure of meeting him years ago, and uh, love been following along with TB12. One of my good friends is a friend of yours, Michael Bronner, and he, you know, he uh, he encouraged me to go to TB12 after I had back surgery. Now, I I I really have avoided weightlifting and strength training my entire life because I just didn't like it. <laughs> it would hurt and it was annoying and I just didn't have it find fun. I'd rather go for a bike ride or play tennis or go for a hike or go cross country skiing. Important or, to be self-aware. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, nah. So then I turned 60 and I'm like, I better get on this. So I started looking, but then I, then I had a back problem and my, my uh, back surgery went really badly. Uh, and not, not most people don't, but I just have a long history of back issues uh, and was in pain for years and years and years and just sort of dealt with it. Um, and I went to Boston to TB12, and I worked with one of the physical therapists and body coaches there. And he worked on me two hours a day, which just was unbelievable. It's really restructuring my entire back and pelvis and all the muscles. And then put me on a rehab program, which has been a, you know, four times a week. And I've been really consistent four times a week since October. And my body has just transformed. I'm 61, and my body is better than it's ever been in my entire life. <laughs> And I'm fitter, stronger, more muscular, and more importantly, I'm out of pain. 
So what's so great about TB12 is that it's not just, you know, getting buff and building muscles. It's about a specific type of training that allows you to engage in your life with full performance, strengthening all the muscles that you need for optimal activities. And, and for me, I was, you know, compensating with muscles that I shouldn't have been, and I wasn't using muscles I should have been. And they basically helped me unload the muscles that I was overusing and strengthen the muscles that I wasn't using. And it's just led to this incredible result. And now I, I just did it this morning. You know? <laughs> it was like, I, and I'm any, and I can do it anywhere. I have all the bands and the pulleys and loop bands, the handle bands. All you need is a door and a mat, basically. And I can travel with it. And literally, I've been ev- everywhere I go, even if I travel, I take it with me and I schedule it. It's, it's just become a priority. And it's literally changed my life. I feel way better, more energetic. I'm able to do things that I want to do. I have, you know, full use of my body. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, for me, you know, my definition of health is being able to wake up in the morning and do whatever you want to do. If I want to ride my bike, you know, 20 miles straight up a hill, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, if I want to, you know, like the other day, it was fun. I had my best day ever. I was like, worked out with t- TB12. Then I went for a four mile hike with a friend uphill. And then I went for a long bike ride. And then I went for play tennis. And then I went for a swim. <laughs> That's a good day right there. You know, <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, wow, you know, I wanted, I could do that, right? Why not? And it's like, you know, just because I'm 61 doesn't mean I can't be as fit or fitter than someone who's 30 or 20. And so I think, I think that's, and the beautiful thing about it is that it, not only is it easy to do and it's, and it's quick and it's actually really inexpensive from my perspective, it's also, um, it's also sort of the most intelligent form of training I've ever come across because using techniques that don't cause injury and don't cause pain and yeah, very don't fun- end up yeah yeah very functional movements so i don't really care about looking like you know mr universe what i care about is being agile and flexible and fit and being able to do whatever I want. i'm gonna like learning to surf or i'm gonna go kite surfing like i feel like at 61 i can learn stuff that i shouldn't probably be doing but why not you know like i i, I want to learn new stuff and and try new things so I think I want to be able to have my body ready for that. So I see, I see like TB12 almost as like, you know, foundational uh, for, for health. And I, I don't know if you know this, John, but I probably referred more people than any, anybody. Yeah. Oh, I, ever do. Had. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but every day oh, I like every refer, day. I think, I, I think I must have free sessions. So I get a credit. I, think <laughs> I, I like, I literally every day, I think I refer at least one or two people. <laughs> well, but that's, I mean, that's the magic of it. Right. And I think you hit the nail on the head. No one wants to be in pain. Right, no yeah. one wants to pain. It's no fun. It affects the quality of your life, and obviously, the this, the message you're getting out in the world is to help you people make really good choices with what they eat. And do that and not be in pain. Like you said, you can do anything. Uh, and it's sixty one. Yeah. I mean, you just had a better day. It sounds like the other day than I've had in a few years. So I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go do that. But look, I appreciate you taking the time today with us, Mark. And again, um, the book The Pegan Diet is out. Uh, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Well, I think they should go to pegandiet.com. I've, I've got partners who offer $500 worth of food and different products and services if you buy the book through the Pegan Diet website. So you can get basically the book for free. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, you can also get it on Amazon, wherever else you get your books. But I think it's really um, you know, a lot of resources, great videos on there, a lot of bonus material. So go to pegandiet.com. If they want to learn more about me, they can go to drhyman.com, listen to my podcast, uh, The Doctor's Pharmacy. That's pharmacy with an F. And of course, follow me on social media at DR, like Dr. Mark Hyman. Great. Well, look, Mark, it was great seeing you here today and having you on and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Thanks. For All right, time. John, you take care. Okay. Take care, buddy. Bye.